Egypt, that the firstborn of every man, the firstborn of every cattle, the firstborn of every creature would die, man or beast. So the the Day of Atonement commemorates that first Passover. That first Passover was pointing to the salvation of Jesus Christ. It was pointing to the sacrifice that Jesus Christ would make on Calvary's cross. So when we plead the blood of Christ over the lives of our people, over anything, we are calling upon the blood because uh, the God knew that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So the, the sacrificial system that took place, that came about, was essentially a repetition of this very fact. But the blood of bulls and goats did not take away sin. But what it did, it appeased God. It was a temporary situation. It was temporary until Jesus came and he would make the ultimate sacrifice. But in the meantime, this is what you do. And so God instructed them from that point on to always do the, 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 the Day of Atonement was the day they commemorated that first Passover. Now, the, we've already seen this earlier, but the chapter 16 just kind of uh, basically gives you the gist. It, it, it repeats everything about the Day of Atonement. And, and, and we, when you look at the first four verses, you see the requirements of the priests. See, the priests can't just do go into the Holy of Holies at any time. You only do it on the Day of Atonement. You can't just go anytime. Well, you see what happened when the sons of Aaron went into the Holy of Holies and what they, uh, uh, they offered a strange fire and they died on the spot. So God had to instruct them. Look, look, I ain't nothing to be played with. You can't do anything. You can't worship the way you want to. You worship the way I want you to worship. He is not going to accept brazen worship and he, he does not and uh, and the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the, the two sons of Aaron when they offered before the Lord and died and the Lord said unto Moses sneak unto Aaron thy brother that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat which is upon the ark that he die not for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. So he, he's telling uh, uh, Aaron that you can't just come into my place anytime you want. You can't just come. That thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullet for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So don't come without the sacrifice, without the proper sacrifice. Okay? That's when you come. Don't just walk in and out. It, it doesn't work that way. And, and he had to prepare himself to go. So what, what, this, what uh, this 16th chapter does, not only does it give instructions for when, it gives instructions for how. So the, the condition of the, the priest Verse 4 lets you know he got to be dressed right. He said, put on the holy linen coat, and he have, shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and he shall be girded with the girt, linen girdle, and with the linen mitre shall he be attired. These are the holy garments. Therewith shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. So first of all, he got to take a bath, and then he put on the holy garments. So his, his externals have to be done, but then he has to make an atonement. You see, the way this thing works, that before the priest can, can give the atonement for the people, he's got to make one for himself. He's got to consecrate himself. And that's what these first four verses are letting us know. The, 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 the responsibility of the priest, he has to uh, consecrate himself. Then he said, take of the congregation of the children is the two kids of the goat for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. So, so he's going to make an, uh, 
His, his whole duty is to make the atonement for the people, for the, for the whole community. And how does he do that? A sin offering with two goats and one burnt offering for a sweet-smelling savor. The burnt offering gets consumed in the fire, but then the, the sin offering has to take place. Uh, one goat, he, he, so he uses two goats, and we'll explain that in a minute. And Aaron shall offer the bullock of a sin offering, which is for himself. See, first of all, before you can represent other folks, you need to be right. So he has to consecrate himself. He has to make an atonement for himself before he can make an atonement for the people. Uh, you don't need your preachers live in any kind of way representing God. You can't represent God before the people any kind of way. So he has to make an atonement for himself. He has to make himself worthy before he can ask God to, um, to, to before he can go before God to make an atonement for the people. And he said, take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he's just kind of giving you a summary of what's going to happen. And he'll explain to you uh, later how it's done. And Aaron shall cast lots on the two goats, one for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Okay? Now, as we look down in these verses... So he'll he'll take the he'll take the for the, the congregation of the people two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Look at verse six. He'll offer a uh, a bull for a sin offering for himself and to make an atonement for himself and for his house. Verse seven. He take the two goats. And uh, uh, before the, the door of the, con the the tabernacle of the congregation, and he shall cast lots on the goats. The cast lots. What do you mean? Like flip a coin. One of the goats is going to be killed, and the other goat is going to be used for the scapegoat. It's going to be released alive. And Aaron shall bring the goat which upon which upon the Lord's lot there. That's the one that's going to be killed to make an atonement. And he'll and but the goat which the other lot fell, the scapegoat, is going to be presented alive and released in the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the flock, uh, uh, he shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, to make an atonement for himself in his house. And he's going to kill the bull for a sin offering. And he shall take the censer, verse 12, for with the burning coals of fire upon the altar for a sweet smelling savor and he bring that within the veil now verse 13 this is this is key and he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat which is upon the testimony that he died not he has to do it that way if he go in there without the censor, without the right sentence. This is what got Abe and Nadab and Abihu killed. They came in there with, uh, uh, with the wrong items. They just came in there with some stuff, with some generic incense. They did not come. First of all, they had no business doing it because they weren't consecrated. And then they had the wrong incense. They had incense that uh, 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 had not gone through the purification process in verse 14 and he said take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it, sprinkle it with the finger upon the mercy seat eastward and he said kill the goat verse 15 for the sin offering that is for the people and bring the blood within the veil and do that with the blood as he did for the blood of the bullock so he'll take the, the blood of the goat and do the same thing and sprinkle it on the altar sprinkle on the uh, the the uh, uh, the mercy seat he'll do he'll do with the goat the blood of the goat the way he did the blood of the bull so the, the same process takes place and he shall make an atonement for the holy place 
because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, because of their transgressions and all their sins, and shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. See, the tabernacle represented, this is where God dwelt, but God dwelt there for the, to have, uh, uh, to be before the people, but the people were not worthy. So they, in order for them to be worthy of God's presence, their, the, the tabernacle of the congregation had to be consecrated. Okay? And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation where he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. So before the priest can make an atonement for the people, he got to do it for himself. He's got to make an atonement for the building. The, the tabernacle itself had to have its uh, uh, had to be consecrated because it was made by who? With the hands of men. Okay, and he shall go out into the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it. The altar itself, he shall make. He shall take the blood of the bullock and the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar round about it. And he shall sprinkle the blood upon uh, upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it. And seven is the number of completeness. And hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Why? Because they made all that stuff. They made it with. They God told them how to do it. But they put all that stuff together, and now to use it in God's service, it had to be consecrated. Okay, this is all. This is what takes place on the Day of Atonement. In verse twenty, here's the key. And when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. See, he does all of that before he brings the goat in. So he, he gives you gives us the instruction on what's supposed to take place, and then he does it. And Aaron shall lay his hands upon the head of the live goat, and he confessed over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and upon all the transgressions in their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. This is another picture of Christ. It was Christ who was outside the camp, walking up Golgotha's hill, carrying that cross, and he was, he, and he was, it was done at the hands of a fit man. Uh, uh, some of the historians say that this was a picture of the um, The man that carried the cross, when Jesus collapsed with the cross, uh, what was the man's name that had the cross? The, he was uh, of, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank, I can't even remember the man's name that carried the cross when Jesus collapsed at the cross and uh, Y'all, I'm supposed to remember this man. Man, he was a black man. He got, uh, he was the uh, he was from um, uh, the place we call Libya. Or uh, the the Cyrenian Simon the Cyrenian. That's his name. Simon the Cyrenian. Uh, he was a fit man, and he had come to uh, to to became a believer. And uh, according to tradition, he became one of the pillars in the early church in the first century. 
Simon the Cyrenian. I, 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 I should have been able to remember that name right off the bat, but I apologize, y'all. I'm getting kind of rusty up here. And that's where he, that's where we that's where he was. So and Aaron and the goat shall bear upon him all the iniquities into the land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat into the wilderness. So the goat had all of the sin of the people ceremonially transferred to him, and he was released out into the wilderness, away from the people. So the sin was no longer ceremonially among the people. It was it was sent away. It, it was it represented the a uh, God's grace on the people. See, when, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, God no longer sees the sin. The sin that is inherent in us, God don't see it. It's been cast away. Well, ceremonially, that's what was happening on the Day of Atonement. That's what that scapegoat represented. Verse 24, And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place, and put on the garments, and come forth, and offer his burnt offering, and the burnt offering of the people, and make an atonement for himself and for the people, and the fat of the sin offering shall he burn upon the altar, and he shall let go the goat for the scapegoat, and he that let go let the goat for the scapegoat shall wash his clothes, and bathe his flesh in water, and afterward come into the camp. See, after he unhandled the scapegoat, the scapegoat represents sin. He's got to wash and put his clothes back on, put his holy garments back on. He can't do that while he's handling the goat because the goat represents sin. Okay? And verse 29, And this shall be a statute forever unto you that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and you shall do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or stranger that still joineth among you, for on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. And it shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. And the priest whom he shall anoint, and whom shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead, shall, take, shall make the atonement and shall put on the linen clothes and even the holy garment. So right now it's Aaron, but Aaron is going to pass this task on to one of his sons, and eventually he, that one is going to pass it on to another one of his sons, and it's going to be a statute forever. So this is a perpetual thing. This is how it's done. Okay? And he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation, and for the altar, and he shall make an atonement for the priest, and for all the people of the congregation. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you, to make an atonement for the children of Israel, for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. And that's how chapter 16 ends. Now remember we've been doing all of these, we've been going over, we went through the law of all the sacrifices and, and, uh, and, and we, we accept the fact that all of these point to Jesus Christ, the work and the, the person and work of Jesus Christ and his, uh, the salvation that he wrought when he shed his blood on Calvary's cross. We recognize that. But you see, a lot of the, these laws seem so unfair. They seem so draconian by today's standards. But remember, all of these laws were given to the children of Israel to secure them, their posterity, to protect them, mainly from themselves. God had to he put a system in place to preserve his people because these were primitive times and uh, God had to, they, they did not have technology. They didn't have science. The, 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 remember when uh, dealing with the, the, the lepers, the, the cleansing of the lepers and the, the diagnosis of leprosy was placed in the hands of the priests and not physicians. 
because God knew that the physicians in that day had, they, knew no, they, they didn't know any science they were just doing the best they could they were basically a bunch of root men they did not know that uh, there were no classes in microbiology there were no classes in um, uh, organic chemistry none of that they were going off tradition based on what somebody else taught them. Uh, 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 the, the science was bad. And uh, oftentimes, the stuff, the, their cures were more harmful than a lot of the diseases. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. And this should be an everlasting statute unto you. Okay, now let's go to chapter 17. Chapter 17 talks about the place for the sacrifice. Now, we already know. So, what God wanted you to know, you just can't do a sacrifice anywhere. Okay? You can't do a sacrifice anywhere. Because uh, I'm not accepting it just anywhere. And if you, anyone, first of all, the, the first premise is this. Understand the sacrificial system. Everything belongs to God. Now, if you notice, uh, on all of these sacrifices, for the most part, it is, uh, when it comes to the beast, they have to be, sometimes they have to be male, uh, sometimes male or female, without spot or blemish. In all cases, with, 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 without spot or blemish. Now, when it comes to the, the birds, when they, if you were uh, the poor people who couldn't afford a ram, couldn't afford a bull, couldn't afford a goat, they would use a turtle dove. They use two turtle doves or two pigeons. And you don't know the age of the pigeon. You have no way of knowing that. All you, all you can do is look at one and see is, a, is, it, is it in perfect condition. If it's in perfect condition, then you can use it for a sacrifice. Then you, you would, uh, so it, it didn't matter. But it had to be in perfect condition. And if it's, uh, if it's uh, a bull or a goat from the flock or the herd, it had to be, God wanted the firstborn. And it had to be perfect. So the firstborn, it had to be perfect. So if 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 this uh, cow had a calf, but it had, it came out with broke legs, you couldn't use it. You used the, the firstborn of another cow. And usually, but they 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 born healthy. But it had to be. Uh, so God knew what he wanted. He, he asked for the sacrifice to be perfect because the sacrifice that he would use ultimately Jesus Christ was perfect. Okay? Now look at verse 3. What man soever that be of the house of Israel that killeth an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp or that killeth it out of the camp and bringeth it not into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer an offering unto the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord shall be imputed unto that man. And he that shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. What is he saying here? If you're going to kill something, it's got to be, the sacrifice has to be at the congregation, at the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, if you kill something out in the woods, and you don't bring it for a sacrifice. Uh, first of all, you're out of order. The, the, the animals, if you have not brought a sacrifice, you ain't got no business going hunting. Because the animals belong to God. If you're raised in a herd and you are raising sheep, you have no business doing a slaughter unless you have brought the sacrifice. And you have no business trying to do the sacrifice yourself. You're not qualified. You bring the sacrifice to the house, to the tabernacle of the congregation, and you let the priest do that job because you're not the priest. God is not going to accept your offering. That's the way it works. To the end of the children of Israel may bring their sacrifice, which they offer in the open field, even even they may bring them unto the Lord unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation unto the priest and offer for peace offerings unto the Lord and the priest shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar of the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and burn the fat for a sweet savor unto the Lord 
and, th and they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils, after whom they have gone a whoring. This will be a statue forever unto them throughout their generations. So they were, uh, uh, you can't make offerings to idols. This goes all the way back to the, um, the Ten Commandments. You make no idols. Don't make offerings to idols. You make your offerings to God. So if you're making an offering on some some hill that you uh some altar that you done put out in the woods somewhere, God ain't accepting that. That's an offering to an idol. And bringeth it not into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer it unto the Lord, even that man shall be cut off from among them. This is a this is a prohibition against um, uh, offering to idols. Now, verse 10, he reiterates the law, the laws against eating blood. And uh, this was first introduced in um, Leviticus chapter 3, verse 17. Don't eat no blood. And whatsoever man that be in the house of Israel or the strangers that sojourn among you that eateth any manner of blood, it will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will be cut off from among the people. Verse 11, here's the key. This is why. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, and it is the blood that maketh an atonement for your soul. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, Neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. Now, let me explain something to you about, about the blood. First of all, the blood of Jesus Christ is what cleanses us of all sin. The life of the flesh is in the blood. That's a principle. Now, let me tell you something. This is how archaic medicine was in that day, especially in, in latter times. This is what killed George Washington. He had this fever because of uh, an abscess tooth. He had a fever, and the the cure for a fever in the 18th century was this thing called bloodletting. They drain all the blood out of people, thinking that they can because uh, the person had a, a high fever, it would drain all the blood out of the person. And what do you think happened to a person when you drain all the blood out of them? They're going to die. They're going to go in the shock and die. Well, guess what? Uh, uh, God was protecting the, the children of Israel from the archaic method of, of, if you listen to this scripture, then bloodletting never would have been done and a whole lot of people who died because that's what the physicians in, in uh, ancient times would do. They would, if somebody had a high fever, they would drain all the blood out of them. And they died. 100% death rate. So the life of the flesh is in the blood. Don't eat blood. Bloodborne illnesses were eliminated, were, were very rare among the Jewish people because they did not eat animals that had blood in it. So if there was contamination, uh, a, a, a Jew would not have caught mad cow disease because they don't eat, the, 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 the blood is drained from any animal that they would eat. They, don't, they did not eat anything with the blood in it. So, uh, uh, microorganisms that live in blood would not, they would not be susceptible to illness in that circumstance. Every soul that is that which died of itself, or that which was torn, this is verse 15, that which was torn with beasts, whether it be of our own country or strangers, shall both wash his clothes and bathe himself with water, and he shall be unclean even until even, and shall then shall he be clean. But if he wash them not, nor bathe his flesh, then he shall bear his iniquity. So if you touch something that was dead, or died, or was killed, and you didn't wash, that iniquity was on you. Basically, these laws protected people during a time when sanitation practices were not that good, when the 
ability to sterilize, sanitize and sterilize. More people died from infection than anything else in that day. Because they did not understand the um, they didn't understand the science of biology. They did not. Um, there was no microbiology. So these small microscopic creatures that could cause you a whole lot of problems, they didn't know anything about that. They didn't have the science knowledge. They did not have the, uh, the research had not been established yet. So God had to protect the people from themselves in their ignorance during these dark ages. Now, When we get to chapter 18, we got the laws against unlawful sexual relations. Now, this is the part that will really get you in trouble in today's society. Because you get kicked out of, uh, uh, you know, this is totally contrary to what um, common uh, cultural norms and cultural mores uh, in our day in the present day uh, propagate and the Lord spake unto Moses saying speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them I am the Lord your God after the doings of the land of Egypt wherein ye dwell shall ye not do and after the doings of the land of Canaan where I bring you shall ye not do neither shall ye walk in their ordinances you shall do my judgment and keep my ordinances and walk therein I am the Lord your God My goodness, okay, he's just setting them up. Look, don't worry about what these other folk doing. What seems normal to the to the Canaanites and to, to the Egyptians, uh, you cannot do what they do. None of you shall approach to any of this near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. This is a prohibition against incest. Uh, uh, why? Because God knows uh, human biology and he knows what happens when the chromosomes get mixed together and uh, y'all near kinsmen, you're going to have retarded children. You can't be having babies with your sister and your first cousin because y'all you subject to have retarded kids. Okay? So that's basically that's what that does. The A prohibition against Incest would reduce the probability of certain uh, innate characteristics uh, such as Down syndrome and um, the mental handicaps with the children. So, so the first prohibition we see is that against uncovering the nakedness of, of someone who is near of kin, uncovering the nakedness, that means having sexual relations with them. The nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother, thou shalt not uncover. She is thy mother, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife, shall thou not uncover. Uh, uh, uncover. This is thy father. It is thy father's nakedness. The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter, daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness, thou shalt not uncover. Don't have sex with your sister. That's what it boils down to. The nakedness of thy son's daughter, your granddaughter. Don't do it. Verse 11, the nakedness of thy father's daughter, begotten of thy father, she is thy sister. Y'all can have the same different, uh, uh, same daddy, different mamas, you still can't do it. So that would be a having a, a prohibition against having intimate relations with a half brother or sister. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, for she is thy mother's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother. Thou shalt not approach to his wife. She is thine aunt. Don't mess with your auntie. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter-in-law. 
She is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy, bro of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. Now there is a there is a a, 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 a rule later that where you a, if a a man if a woman's husband was to die, the brother of and they have no children. The 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 brother of the man, if he is unmarried, he has to marry the his brother's wife and the first child born the first child born to them would be the heir of the brother who died and not yours and then the second child would be your heir but the first one would be the heir of your brother now that was the heir that was the the near kinsman thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of of a woman and her daughter neither shall thou take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness for they are near kinswoman it is wickedness neither shall thou take a wife to her sister to vex her to uncover her nakedness besides the other is in her lifetime and that, this is the, the um, uh, if, if the if the wife is still alive you can't have her you can't mess with her sister but if your wife passed it, it would be okay if your if your first wife passed it's okay to marry her sister moreover thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile, to defile thyself with her and thou shalt not let of any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God I am the Lord there was a practice in that day to sacrifice children to the Canaanite God Molech they would actually send them in a fire and burn them that's what that's the human sacrifice so this is a prohibition against human sacrifice and that's what this 21st verse is prohibiting now verse 22 this is what gets you in trouble in today's society because there's some folk that uh they they, they would um uh, if you if you propagated this idea right now you spoke this in the public arena, you'd be, uh, you'd be talked about so bad. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is abomination. In other words, you can't have sexual relations with another, with a man as if he was a woman. If you're a man, this is a, pro a prohibition against homosexuality. Pure and simple, right here. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile with thyself, neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereunto. It is confusion. Uh, uh, it is a, a prohibition against bestiality. There are some women that would love to go with a horse. Come on now. Uh, I was reading on the uh, internet when some woman was arrested because she somebody took pictures of her uh, molesting a dog. And folks, some folks just nasty. Defile not ye yourselves with any of these, for in all these the nations are defiled which I cast out before you. You see, these are the reasons why the Canaanite and the Jebusites and the Perizzites, that's why they were kicked out of the Holy Land in the first place. That's why God gave the land over to the, the children of Israel because these were the practices that those people were doing and God kicked them out of the land and gave it to Israel. Now, I know some folk in our culture, you go to talking about, uh, uh, they don't want you talking about Leviticus 18.22. 
because uh, our society not only does it, it praises um, uh, uh, homosexuality uh, it, it, it glorifies it and, and, and if you don't glorify it in the public arena you are going to be castigated you're going to be talked about uh, you're going to be maligned they're going to talk about you you're going to lose jobs you're going to lose businesses uh, you're going to be destroyed in this society unless you go along with it. But God, the word of God said it's an abomination. And anyone who uh, preaches that, you're going to be real unpopular in this culture. Now, why is that? Why, why was that so important? Why could not God allow people, if two men uh, love each other, they should be able to to, to do what they want. That's what people say. That's, that's, the, that's the, the argument. Now, here's the reason. Other than this is plain nasty, but whenever a, a foreign protein is injected into the lower extremities of the digestive system, in other words, the anus, if, if protein, which is basically semen, which is made primarily a protein, if a foreign protein is ingested into the, the digestive system, it breaks down, it breaks down the immune system. It compromises the immune system. That's why when uh, AIDS hit, it, it hit the, the gay community harder than it did any other community because in fact I suspect patient zero was probably uh, engaging in uh, rectal intercourse when semen is introduced into the digestive system the, the, the back end of the digestive system the lower extremities of the digestive system it breaks down it compromises the immune system well mankind didn't know that but God did so by prohibiting the, that type of sexual activity, you are protecting humanity from itself. Now, not, not only that, God gave humans the mandate to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And you can't replenish the earth when a man is having sex with another man or a woman is having sex with another woman, it's just not going to happen. Regardless of how much they care about each other, y'all not going to make no baby. A semen and fecal matter does not make a baby. And it's just that simple. Spit don't make babies. Okay? Uh, it takes a male gamete uh, coming into union with a female gamete to fertilize the male gamete, fertilizes the female gamete, the male gamete that's called a sperm, and the female gamete that's called an, uh, an ova, an egg. When that that male sperm uh, uh, pollinates the female uh, egg, then conception takes place. With uh, uh, that. A semen being introduced into a, a, a fecal matter can't make a baby. All he can do is break down the immune system of the of the host, and they are subject to all kinds of diseases. And that's just uh, uh, I ain't making this up. Y'all do your own research. So I know I know what I'm talking about. Uh, our society praises homosexuality. It pra practically worships it. But the reality is what God was trying to do, even with the laws against uh, unlawful sexual relations, were to protect humanity from itself, from its worst instincts. Verse 27. For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled, and the land spew not you out also which you defile it. It has spewed out the nations that were before you. So it, it, uh, unless you 
you know, if you insist on living this way, the land will spew you out, just like it did the people who came before you. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among the people. Therefore shall ye keep mine ordinance, that ye commit not any of these abominable customs which were committed before you, and that ye defile not yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. My goodness. Boy, that is not some popular stuff in our culture. You go to preaching and teaching this, they're going to walk out to church, they're going to you let the wrong person hear that. Uh, it's some folks. It's a good thing I ain't got the twenty likes on uh, uh, on Facebook because this get out. But I'm this is the word of God. I'm just preaching. I'm just reading from the word, explaining the word. I'm uh, I'm explaining the word and to giving you the the biblical narrative and the social. And scientific ramification of, of violating it. Uh, men with men can't produce, cannot satisfy the mandate to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. It's not going to happen. And if you try to do it, you're subject to uh, uh, bring about all kinds of sicknesses and disease on yourself because doing so compromises your immune system. And it's just that simple. They don't hear that part. They, don't hear that part. they won't even admit to it. In fact, I'm going I'm to tell you the reason why some of the HIPAA laws were passed. They did not want people who were HIV positive to be outed. When the, the, the HIV his, uh, um, first hit back in the 80s, uh, people were, they were saying, we know how to get rid of it. We just, when anybody comes down with HIV, you publish their name so folk would know who got it and folk know not to be messed up with them. <laughs> well, that was going to be mean. Folk, well, you know how people are, they find out somebody got AIDS, they'll, uh, people are, are mean. Now, fortunately, they did a lot of research and they learned how to, uh, they uh, came up with a lot of drugs, billions of dollars of research went into it, um, and um, uh, people can live long lives HIV positive now. In fact, um, the T cell, Counts, which what they use to measure how sick somebody might be, uh, can be reduced to the point where you it's almost untraceable with certain drugs that they have out right now. Thank God. But the bottom line is, if you had not done this in the first place, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have to spend these billions of dollars of research because the, it never would have happened. It never would have happened. So God has, he gave the children of Israel these laws to protect them from themselves, from the, uh, from their, their, their most base desires had to be, if you violate this, uh, God said, I'll strike you dead. Well, he, you know, and he told uh, Adam and Eve, uh, don't, the, the, the treat. The fruit of the, he told Adam from the, the fruit of this tree, you can have everything you want, but don't, don't eat from this tree. And, and uh, uh, so uh, Eve was uh, tempted, talked Adam into eating of that tree, and uh, death passed upon mankind, but not immediately. But death passed. Adam and Eve were supposed to be immortal. But because they violated that principle, uh, uh, sin entered into the world and death passed upon all men for all who sinned. All of their offspring were born with this blood disease called sin. So all humans, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's why we need Jesus. That's why. All of these sacrifices were put in place so that the sin of mankind could be atoned and God could continue fellowshipping with humans even in their messed up condition. So the children of Israel were given this system to hold them over until Jesus Christ would come and make the sacrifice, the final sacrifice that would remedy sin in the presence of human beings once and for all. 
So we'll see y'all next time. We're going to pick you up next week, chapter 19, 20, and 21. Um, we will try to do this in a way we, we're going to just call it just like we see it. But we're also going to let you know what God's intention was and what the ramifications are by complying with God's word. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we share right now uh, with your people. We pray that you will allow the word to go forth with clarity, that someone will uh, recognize that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So forgive us of our sin, Lord, and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Allow your word to continue to go forth. Equip your saints, equip your ministers, equip your messengers, give them boldness that they can go into the world and, and just call it like they see it, call it the way it is, call it the way thus saith the Lord, and be not afraid, because God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, he shall reap. And we know that, uh, that, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we thank you, we praise you, and we ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now we're going to uh, be back on on Sunday morning at 10.15. Uh, we hope you join us. Now those of you that may want to give to the ministry, you may do so using Cash App or Zelle. Cash App W uh, WL Green at Yeah, dollar sign WL Green and the uh, Zelle is uh, 689 Two four six five eight nine two. Any gift of any amount be greatly appreciated, and uh, you be sowing into some good ground. Uh, we're gonna see y'all next time. Uh, may God uh, richly bless you, my beloved. <laughs>